and today's topic is robotic inspection maintenance and repair of urban water systems over to you sir okay so good afternoon all it's been a great pleasure to be here today so the title is slightly different it's actually simplified to robots in water but effectively it's the same thing so uh, yeah just for that we're back on track now so yes yeah, so uh, a bit about me you've heard a bit already about me so I did my degree and my PhD at University of Leeds in the area of robotics and mechatronics, building systems. In particular, I was in medical robotics at that point. Um, I returned to the University of Leeds from Manchester, and now I'm full professor in um, robotics there. Um, the kind of things I do mostly are robots for exploration, robots in city infrastructures, that is robots that can inspect things like roads, rails, to try and repair them, and that kind of thing. And at least several projects in the UK in that area. So Leeds, I guess maybe you don't know where Leeds is. Leeds is around about here, around about halfway in England. Um, so it's quite a sort of a, um, a semi-rural area. So you have a city, and outside the city you have lots of green land. So if you do find yourself in the UK, please do come across and see us. Very much um, love to see you across in the UK. About a week ago, that's where, I, that's where I was in the snow and things. So it's quite an interesting um, experience coming here where it's nice and warm, so it's very pleasurable. Um, so, yes, yeah, so robotics at Leeds. So, we have multiple things we're doing, and we have the areas of robot therapies, often medical. So, robot therapies are robots that can restore lost function. So, for example, if you um, have an injury, like a brain injury, you wear a robot, after a period of time, you recover that function and the robot goes away, so it's a therapy you recover. A similar but different theme that we have is on assistive and enhanced robot. In this case, it's a medical thing again, you're never going to recover the lost function and you want to be able to, replace, to carry on functioning. So for example, if you lose your leg or lose your arms, then you have a device that you wear forever, and of course that means you can carry on using your life, using things going forward. Um, also have surgical technology, so surgery of course, trying to perform surgery on the body with the least possible um, influence on the body, least possible impact on the body. And we also do lots of work on enabling technologies, so artificial intelligence, other things like that. Today, I will be talking in the theme of exploration, um, but much more, sorry, is it, is, it, is it? Can you hear me at the back, is that okay? Is the sound okay, yeah? No, you can't hear me? Okay. Is that better? Like that, yeah? Okay, I'll talk here then, it's fine, okay. Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking mostly in the area of exploration, 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 exploration robots, but in particular with application to water systems. I want to briefly give a bit of a flavor about robotics. I guess most of you don't know much about robotics, so just some really fundamental things about robots first. So when you create a robot, ideally you are given a problem you go away, you create a robot, you design it, then you validate, and then you have a solution. That's really the, the kind of the, the, what you'd love to do. The reality is that you have this kind of crazy sort of scenario like this. This scenario, so you, you build a robot, you design it, then you find it doesn't work, you have to change it, you have to modify it, test it. There's a continual cycle of different things to going on. So but this is what you end up with. Perfectly it would be that, but more likely it's going to be this over here. When you physically make a robot, I guess most of you will think about doing things like in your workshops, maybe where you cut a bit of metal, saw something. These days, though, we make robots using many different techniques. And here we've got a slide that shows different kind of scales. So the top scale here is very much the conventional machining sort of thing. So you go into your, your workshop, you saw something, you cut something. That's fine for making things that you can see and touch quite easily, um, but we can make very, very small robots, even down to micro robots these days. Um, so we have different techniques to do that. So um, things like chemical etching, where you put chemicals on, using lights to burn things away, that kind of thing. And we can make really, really small robots, these techniques. So, um, so conventional robots, conventional manufacturing techniques are fine for very large structures. But when you're going down to very small structures, even down to really micro structures, so down here, things like the size of viruses, we can make little structures that kind of size. Not robots, but little structures that kind of size these days. So interesting to reflect upon the manufacturing techniques. And of course, as you're building a robot, you should think about how you make it. That's important to make sure you can make it, of course, in the real world. They have to move, robots do. So to make a move, you have motors. 
You have different types of motors to make them move. I've got three examples here. So I've got a brush, a brush motor, a brushless motor, and a stepper motor. I'll mention briefly what they are. So of course, the aim of a motor is to convert electrical energy into movement, into rotation. So in this case here, with a brush motor, what you do, you have a coil of wire, you give it electricity, that causes it to create a magnetic field, of course, and that magnetic field opposes permanent magnets, bits of um, material that are magnetic. And when you have opposition, you cause forces, and that causes rotation. The reason it's called a brush motor is that in order to provide the electric power to a rotating surface, you have brushes which are sprung bits of material, and they sit here and touch this material here. So as you apply the voltage, it starts to spin, and of course, as it spins around, you get that motion. So these things here are quite important brushes. A brushless DC motor is important in, in many ways. I'll come to that later on. But the way it works is that you have similar principles. You have electric forces. You have magnetic forces um, causing attraction and repulsion. But in this case, there are no brushes. In this case, you have multiple coils. So if you want to rot cause a rotation, you have to energize coils in sequence. As you energize a coil, you pull it around a little bit, a little bit. So if you pulse these in a certain sequence, you cause rotation. And that, of course, causes movement, which is what you want. Um, so that's, that's a brushless one. The downside here, of course, is that on the first case, you get a battery, you stick it on, it spins around, the brushes do the work. In this case, you need electronics to sequence the coils to cause it to rotate. An extension of this kind of idea is a stepper motor. In a stepper motor case, you have multiple poles. So you have a, maybe, maybe you have 20 or even more different types of poles, and you have pulses. So what you do is you provide pulses to two different signals. Every pulse is a small turn. So by pulsing these two signals quite frequently, you end up with it rotating around. You get a rotation. Uh, the good thing with stepper motors is you can control position without having any sensors. So you give it 50 pulses. It'll move 50 increments, and you know an increment is three degrees, so you know exactly how far it's gone. So many devices use different motors for this reason because it's simple to control in that sense. So you have a device now that you've built that can move. I won't mention sensors here, but of course you need to be able to sense the environment, be it a laser sensor, a camera, this kind of thing. A robot should make decisions by itself. It should go and do something um, by itself. So you have different models of what you call autonomy. Autonomy being how can a robot make decisions by itself? In an industrial environment, a robot would do this thing called the sense, think, act cycle. So what it does, it measures things. Once it, what, depending on what it sees, it does a predefined action, and that action is executed, and then it measures again. So it's a sequence of things. It'll do this, then keep repeating it, sensing, measuring, keep doing the same thing over and over again. Fine for industry, picking and placing things, very simple, very straightforward. It doesn't really work that well in other applications like, like autonomous robots more generally because it's very hard to perceive exactly what's going on. So there are other ways you can do that. You can have a thing called a behavior-based approach. This is what things like robot vacuums use and that kind of thing. So rather than having a set thing where you measure, do a set, set of instructions, you have lots of tasks the robot can choose from and it activates the task depending upon what it sees, how it does things. So, here it senses things, then it has these different things it could do, and of course, once, once it chooses one of these, it puts them to the actuators. So for example, it's driving around, maybe it sees something, that triggers a certain behavior and causes it to do something. But at any time, any one of these behaviors can be triggered. So it can be triggered at any time. It gives it much more flexibility to adapt and to be responsive to things. The downside of this is it's very hard to predict exactly what's going to happen. So it's fine for a robot vacuum cleaner. It's driving around. If it decides to go left rather than right, that's fine. No problem. If you were to do this in a nuclear de um, facility, for example, if it did something you didn't expect because the behavior became triggered, it could be very dangerous. So um, fine for things where the actions aren't critically um, planned. If you need critical movements, for example, a nuclear power station, you must do the sense, think, act. That way, because you've got one continuous chain, you can absolutely guarantee what it will do in a given situation. In terms of making robots autonomy, so autonomy is how a robot can go and do its own thing. So for example, a radio control car, you have that, you control it with your controller. It does no autonomy, it's completely controlled by yourself. That means we're down here, we're down autonomy one. 
no autonomy, it's making no choices by itself, it's just doing its own thing. As we go up the levels of autonomy, we get more and more um, capable of it's by itself. So, for example, if I was to choose, um, let's say, number five, in number five, um, what it's going to do, it's going to do something that you, that you agree with. So it might say to you, hi, how are you doing? Can I get you a cup of tea? And you go, yes. So now it's doing autonomy, but it's asking for your approval. So it's very much autonomous in some context, but it, you're still much in the loop. You're still having the final say, still doing things. As we go up the autonomous level, it gets, gets obviously more, more and more complicated. So for example, um, number eight is probably the um, highest we'd ever want to do in terms of a robot. So level eight, it means it'll tell you what it's doing, but only if you ask it. So it'll go around doing whatever it wants. If you say to it what you're doing, it'll interact with you. But generally speaking, it's fully autonomous, but it will at least respect you and report to you and say to you what, what it's going to do. If we go to level nine, level nine is even more difficult. So level nine means that the robot's going to tell you something only if it decides it wants to do so. You can't say to it, tell me, tell me what's going on. It'll only inform you if it decides it's going to inform you. So I think that, that'll be a situation we never want to have, where a robot's going to do what it wants and decide whether to tell us things or not. If we go right to the very highest autonomy, this is definitely undesirable. So level 10 autonomy is the robot is fully autonomous and it'll do exactly what it wants by itself. It'll never actually interact with us. It won't, won't respect us. That'd be really, really bad. So I think um, we want to have some kind of balance here. So autonomy is not yes or no. There are different levels of autonomy. And I guess we see a world going forward where we're working with robots. They're interacting with us, but they're never actually going to be fully autonomous in the, in the formal sense of the word. That brings us on to the principles of robots. So we're talking about autonomy, robots doing its own thing. Um, of course, it needs to act in a kind of an ethical, sensible way. So in this case here, um, of course, number one is quite obvious. Robots shouldn't kill people. They should do what they need to do by themselves. Um, the second one's a bit less obvious, that um, humans um, are not robots. Um, so robots are tools designed to achieve things. So it's just about you know, making sure the balance between what a robot is the robot's not a human, it shouldn't, didn't necessarily have our own, its own rights as we do, that kind of thing. Um, <coughs> I think this, this second from last one is quite interesting as well. So there's lots of work developing robots um, that are designed to be um, for the elderly, so company, so small dogs, um, seals, for example. They're designed to look like animals, to comfort people who are elderly, and they're nice. I've, I've, I've held a few of them and things, and they're nice. You stroke them, they purr, the little head moves, you know, it's, it's, it, they're kind of cute. Um, that's good, but the important thing with this principles here is it should never try to deceive someone. So that kind of animal, w w a robot I should say, should always be true to itself. So when you, when you hold it, okay, it's cute, you like to hold it, but it's always very obvious what it is. This is quite difficult though in terms of people who have very serious mental problems because they perhaps don't realise that how do you ensure someone who's quite vulnerable um, holding a robot that's furry, for example, um, really understands it's not real. And there's definitely a barrier there between that kind of thing and that way. Um, and the last one's also very important, very kind of, uh, I guess, timely, in the sense of autonomous vehicles. So autonomous cars, very common around the world, going to be going forward quite soon. If autonomous car hits a property, hits a person, very important legally to know who's responsible. Is it the person that bought the car? Is it the person that built the car? Is it the person that stepped out in front of the robot? So legal responsibility is very, very important in autonomous vehicles. And I think, you know, as I said before, the autonomous scale, once you get up to like autonomy 10, effectively it's going to do what it wants. In that case, who would be responsible? I guess it would be the people who assemble it. Um, but we're working very hard, um, both in the UK and around the world, not me personally, but people are working very hard, especially in autonomous cars, to satisfy this thing. So if you have, you have car insurance, most of you do in here probably, um, if you have car insurance, then you, you crash your car, they, they try and determine who's liable. In an autonomous car context, that's much more tricky. Who is responsible is very important. OK, so I've gone through um, lots of stuff about the introduction to robots. So um, I'll talk more specifically about, I guess, what we're talking about, the topic today, about robots. Um, so really down here, we're really looking at the kind of water-based exploration. So I do exploration robots. That's really robots that go into places to sample, to collect, to inspect, to see what's going on. And this can be in many domains. Um, in this case, talking more about water-based robots um, in that domain. <coughs> um, I should say, by the way, that um, the actual 
economic value of robots these days is huge. So these numbers here, these numbers represent the value or predicted value of robots by 2020 worldwide. So for example, I pick a number out. Um, for example, in the energy sector, the value of robots to the energy sector is going to be 65 UK billion UK pounds, which of course is, is, is much less than your, your currency. So really, really enormously high value of these things. And robots will not only make money, so in this, this pie chart here, we've got these blue ones here that are actually making more money, but also save money. So for example, in healthcare and nuclear sectors, robots will actually reduce the cost of doing certain things. So robots will not only make money for some people, they will make some, some jobs ch cheaper and simpler to do. Um, so I've already shown you the thing about robots. I just want to show you an overall sketch. This is just, it's a random robot one of my students made, one of my um, level four students. So just to give you an idea of what a robot might comprise from. So a robot, of course, has some kind of movement thing we've seen before about motors. It'll have a sensor. On board, some kind of battery power. It'll have a computation system. So robots really are systems. So I showed you earlier on individual parts. Individually, they don't do much. There must be a system of things working together to achieve an overall aim. So in the water sector, we're talking about water today, of course, um, that has enormous things we can do. So for example, we have things like buried water pipes. They can leak, they can burst. All these kind of problems can go on with water pipes. That's, that's an important thing. Um, reservoirs, certainly in, in, in Europe, in the UK, but probably also here, where you store large quantities of water. You might want to inspect and survey the structures around that, so that's also very important. Um, you have water storage tanks, where you put water in. You might want to inspect them. Um, sewage, of course, very important. So keeping sewage clean, um, sewers clean, I should say, from blockages, that kind of thing. And also subsea. So subsea, you have lots of pipes going around, carrying all kinds of things, communications, that kind of thing. So there's a really, I guess, big domain for robots to be used in the water sector. Um, and I think it has a lot to do. And of course, we know environmentally, in particular, that um, water management, water resource is very scarce. We need to make sure we don't lose it. I, I don't know the number offhand, but around the world, the amount of water is being wasted in pipes, I'm sure, is absolutely not, it's astronomical. So if we can try to minimize the wastage of water, then that's a really important thing to do. So if we look specifically, of course, as I mentioned before, there are different types of robot and things. So um, one, well, the most obvious class, I guess, is underwater robots. So we're going to put a robot into the water and put it underwater. There are different kinds of things we can do with that. Um, but there are definitely big challenges. So robots in water is really tough for the environmental reasons. So we have low temperatures, so very deep underwater. You have to be able to withstand cold. The cold is there, you can't avoid that. You have to design around that. Um, likewise, um, pressure. So as we know, if you go diving underwater, pressure gets high. Um, robots experience that pressure as well. So you need to be able to withstand the pressure around the robot so it doesn't, doesn't combust. It's very, doesn't implode, very difficult challenge. Um, also corrosion, in particular in salt water, corrosion is a very big thing. So the salt water chemicals, they get into the robot, they cause it to rust, degrade, to break. So it's really quite challenging for us to build robots that work in water. Um, this is one of my favourite robots I've sort of found. So not mine, unfortunately, I didn't make it, it's from Stanford. So a humanoid underwater robot, fully submersible, humanoid thing. Um, I'll show you that it's easier than it's going on. So they're controlling it through haptic feedback. That means when they, when they move the arms, they can feel the forces. They can swim around underground, under the water, grabbing at things, picking up things. In this case, they picked up a, I think it was a vase they picked up. But it just shows the complexity you can achieve. So we all think of underwater robots as being big circles, but in fact, it could be um, much more complicated things. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's obviously a very impressive um, robot. So we can do lots of things, but you have to overcome these challenges to do that. So I guess the first thing is we're going to build an underwater robot. We can build it any size and shape we want to, um, but it needs to go and move in a certain direction. What kind of shape should it be? So if we look at um, different kinds of shapes, so we have here different kinds of things. So we have a sphere, a sphere being a football, a circle. We have a cylinder, a cylinder being, of course, a cylinder long cylinder with flat ends. We have a saucer being like an alien sort of thing, so a saucer being a flat dish saucer or an egg shape. So each shape has different characteristics. So, for example, if we look at the, the sphere, 
The sphere is good because it's got a good volume for its actual weight, so it's quite dense, quite a compact structure. Um, and it's really good for going underwater because the pressure is spread around evenly. So if you have a different shape, when you're deep underwater, of course, the pressure will be the worst at certain points. So if you've got a sphere, that's good. Um, <coughs> the downside is, of course, it's really hard to drive it. You've got a, a complete football, a complete sphere, really hard to make it go in one direction. It, just, it doesn't want to go in one direction. It wants to spin around. So that's a downside of having a sphere. A cylinder is easy to make very easy to fabricate. Um, it has a really nice length, depth, diameter ratio. Um, but the, high, the, the problems with it are, in particular, actually the enclosures. So if you're making a cylinder, when you fabricate it, of course, you've got these end caps to put on. That's where the water's going to come into. That's where it's going to break. So it's quite hard to have that. Um, a saucer is quite good, really good at gliding through the water, really aerodynamic going through. Um, but it's, it's hard to control again. So the sphere, of course, can spin in all directions. The saucer can spin around very hard to control. Um, and it's, it's quite kind of flat and things. It's quite hard to do. Um, so really, an egg is probably the, most, the best kind of scenario to have in terms of a vehicle. It has a, an egg has a set direction. So you put it in the water. Of course, where the, where the end's smallest will be the forward direction. Um, really kind of really contoured, directed, good for pressure, very smooth surfaces, no sharp edges. The downside of an egg shape is really hard to build. So how do you fabricate that kind of continuous structure? Really, really hard to make. But, so it's interesting. The actual, the actual shape of it is really important. A robot on land, we don't really care about. A robot in the water, we do care about because of the pressure and the forces that act upon that robot. Um, likewise, the materials we use to manufacture it are very important. And here's just a comparison of different types of material. Um, so we have different kinds of weights, different kinds of strengths, different kinds of things. If you look at this thing here, <coughs> so you'll see things like, um, things like composites, so a, a ceramic, so a carbon um, polymer composite is probably one of the most efficient structures to fabricate it from. Um, ceramic's very good, but ceramic's very hard to actually manufacture. So the ceramic structure is very difficult. Metals, of course, are good, but they're quite heavy. So not only the shapes that's important, but also the actual materials you use, and you have got a choice. You can choose different types of materials for manufacturing that. Another criteria, of course, so, okay, let's just say we have this egg-shaped underwater vehicle. If we want to move forward, we have to have some way of putting out a propeller or something. Something from the inside has to come to the outside to make it move. So we have to have probably a rotating shaft. So probably there's like an egg shape with a hole in it with a rotating shaft coming out. If you have that hole, that, of course, is where the water's going to come in. That's where it's going to fail. So we need some way of actually being able to seal it off. So we have these, these rotational bearings, for example. There are different kind of things here. So there's a V-seal. This one here is a V-seal. This one here, what it shows is that um, that's great for sealing liquid from the inside going outwards, for example. So if you want to lubricate, so a bearing rotates. It must have oil so it can rotate. So a V-seal holds the oil in, stops dust coming in, but doesn't stop things like water pressure. So really you need like a double seal like over here. So a double seal will allow you to keep the grease on the rotating parts of the bearing, but also stop water coming into the system, which of course is a problem. Um, so that's probably one of the most useful things, but there are other things. It depends upon not only the pressure, also the speed. If your shaft is spinning very, very fast, then it's more challenging and you have issues with that. So if it's going slowly, you can probably get like this one here, I think, um, which one is it? Um, <laughs> this one here, if it's going slowly, you can perhaps get a rubber seal just pressing on. That might be good enough. As it goes faster, it wouldn't be good enough because it would it'd vibrate too much and it'd vibrate off. So, um, so we need to seal some things on going through. Um, there are more complicated ways of doing this to have sealed systems. So in this case here, what we have is we have a, a thing inside here that's um, inside, a, inside a case, completely sealed separately, and I have a magnet here. So what we're doing, we're using magnets to go through material so you have a magnet on the outside, material, magnets on the inside, and therefore you can drive. So you can see here, you've got the outer casing here. This is all sealed, and you've got magnets inside here. So that means that you can drive a, drive, a, drive a motor propeller whilst keeping your system completely watertight. Um, but of course, the downside of this is it's complicated, and you'll get losses in that sort of thing. So when you've got this, you've got frictional losses. So it's not, by no means is it the perfect solution, but it's a good solution to do things. Um, in this case, I'm going to show you here a brushless motor. Um, it might seem a kind of crazy thing to do, but um, let's just stick it in the water, shall we? See what happens. <laughs> so.
So, because I showed you at the beginning, when you've got a brushless remote, remember, a brushless motor has magnets and it has um, coils, but there is no physical abundance of air gap. Because of the air gap, there is no sparking, no shorting out. So you can just stick them in water, which is quite strange. So electrically, absolutely fine. As I mentioned earlier on, if you um, use water, you get corrosion. So that's, that's the issue. So you can stick it in water, it will spin. Depending upon the kind of water you stick it in, quite soon you're going to end up with corrosion damage of the actual motor itself. So, so it's, it's, it's fine for simple projects. We do it with some of our students do this to test things out. Um, but you're looking at a very limited life cycle because sooner or later it's going to start to rust inside there and become damaged, which is not great. Um, so yeah, so I've shown you lots of negative things, lots of challenges. But one thing that's interesting is when you look at water, it offers opportunities to use robots in different kind of ways. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to show you a video about soft robotics. So soft robotics are robots that are made from plastic or rubber material that you can actuate through air or through wires. And because it's in water, the buoyancy of the water supports the structure and you can do useful things. So as you'll see in the video here, the analogy is like an octopus. An octopus is really amazingly capable in water. If I took it out, put it on land, it hasn't got the bone structure or the strength to do things on land, but in water it's very useful. So we can use the buoyancy of water to our advantage. And I'll show you this actually colleagues from the University of Pisa, obviously in Italy, who worked on this. So I'll just show you a br briefly a bit of their video. <coughs> So what we're doing now is showing conventional robots. Maybe you can't hear him speaking. I'll talk for him then. So what they're doing here, they're putting um, flexible robots that can um, obviously go in water and be actuated by air, I think, in this particular case. So they're putting air into, into the robot. The structure itself is flexible, which means it deforms to different, different forces, different kinds of things in the water. So you can make sort of soft robot legs, that kind of thing. Um, so mostly they're not good for land. So if you do on the land, you have to have extra support material. But in water, as you'll see for this in a moment for this sort of thing here, in water they're amazing because the buoyancy supports the structure. You can do all kinds of weird, complicated things you couldn't do. And it's actually soft robotics is probably the hot topic of the last sort of three or four years in robotics. It's really where we've made the most advances. So what we're saying here is, okay, octopus, um, can we try and replicate an octopus to do an underwater robot? So octopuses are amazing. They're totally flexible. They can get into really small spaces. If we could do the same techniques with um, robots, wouldn't that be great? <coughs> I'll just show you a video in a minute where, where he puts his arm in the hand, hand water for so one minute and it'll come up. Um, so yeah, they're, they're using wires in this case to pull them. So make octopus lengths like this. Use, use wires and cables. You pull the wires and cables, it causes it to flex and to bend in different ways. So you can see as he picks it up, it's really flexible, really like a loose material. It's not at all like a robot you might see conventionally. You see as, as he pulls the string, you'll see it flex and bend in different ways. And depending upon how you pull the wires, you have three or four wires. Depending upon how you pull them depends upon how it flexes and how it changes. So really quite controllable structures. So yeah, so when you put it in the water, it really comes to life, much more flexible. <coughs> so, I'll open this one. so you see here, of course, it's flexible. It can wrap around structures because it's all going quite flexible stuff. Um, so yeah, so um, that's um, soft robots in that case, that's using the buoyancy. You can also use the properties of the actual water to make things work. So there's a kind of an area of research called electroactive polymers. Basically, they, these are materials that when you apply electric to them, mostly polymer-based materials, when you apply voltage to them, they deform. In this case here, it's what's called an ionic polymer metal composite, but it works solely because it has water in the system. So what we have, a piece of material, sandwiched to top and bottom are bits of metal, and in the middle of the material, you have um, water. It needs to be wet. So when you apply a voltage, you'll see on the left-hand side here, when you apply the voltage, what happens is that the water pulls along electron signals, little cations, that causes a swelling of water on one side and causes it to bend and deflect. 
Um, so it's really quite a nice, simple um, actuation mechanism, but it must be wet. So lots of research over the years has tried to seal the water in and things. If it's in water already, it's just really simple. A bit of material, attach a voltage to it, it'll bend. It's that simple. And we can see here, um, it's not one of my examples, I'm from the internet, um, of a simple thing here. They've got a little fish, and it's bending and it's flopping. It's not the best example by any means of, um, of locomotion, but a strip of material, they apply a voltage to it. As you apply a voltage, it swells on one side, the other side. You can cause it to bend backwards and forwards, and you can cause it to do things. One of the great things about this kind of technology is, if I was to cut it, it would still work. It's incredibly robust to, to kind of damage because it's, the whole sheet is, is being deformed. Uh, so it's very, very robust to damage, um, which is good. Um, so I've mentioned about water things. I want to mention briefly about the application domain more generally. Um, so we're talking about robots really, in, I guess, mostly in urban environments. So we spoke at the beginning about different environments. There are some subsea things, but most of the things about water are actually on the land. They're pipes, they're taps, they're mostly on the land here. So we have a very big project in the UK looking at um, robots for resilient infrastructure, focused around trying to protect infrastructure. The project generally is all kinds of things, roads, pipes. Um, I'll talk a bit about pipes here in particular. Um, so one of the things, of course, when we're doing this is we can use robots in many ways. The most obvious thing is let's put a robot into a pipe to fix a crack. That's the most obvious thing. But there are loads of things you can do from measuring the ground before you lay the pipes to actually when you put the pipes in to measuring where the pipes are um, to repairing the pipes. When they're finished, let's get rid of the pipes. Let's decommission them. Let's remove them out of the system. So there are, there's much more than just a robot in a pipe. There's a whole life cycle of pipes from the creation, building, assembly to removal that we can use robots for. Um, there is a white paper I should mention that I wrote from the UK. It's downloadable if you're interested. Um, if you do a search for that, you'll find it. That talks more generally about infrastructure and how robots can be used for infrastructure, I guess, for smart cities. Um, we identified many challenges in this white paper about robots in, in, in cities for infrastructure. Um, the ones that are most relevant to this water type topic. Um, fire and forget is a concept we developed. Um, this is really about how you can have robots in the water system for long periods of time. So not like a day, not like a week. Let's put a robot in a pipe, leave it there for three years. It just wanders around, constantly wanders around. Maybe it collects energy from flowing water, so it parks itself up. As water flows, it recharges itself, wanders around inspecting, measuring, perhaps repairing stuff. Um, so that's a really important concept, I think. And that's going to happen. That's going to happen fairly soon. That It won't be a question of dig a hole, put a robot in, take it out. We'll put it in there leave it there for long periods of time, and it'll just be going around. We won't even know it's there. You're walking around doing your daily business underground. Robots will be doing things to repair and maintain structures. Um, so, yeah, so that's, I guess that's the most, most relevant thing. We're also interested, of course, in, in how you can dismantle things. And one thing, of course, very important to this kind of process is data and decisions. So let's say we have 10,000 robots in pipes across India. How do they collect data? Where does the data go to? How do you manage that data? It's quite difficult. So... Robots must have access to smart data, smart cities, in order to be successful. Um, so this, this project has a vision for the UK of what we're calling zero disruption by 2050. In the pipe context, that means that there will be no roads dug up, no damage. The whole city will be self-repairing. So nobody will be going around repairing pipes. They will self-repair. People often say to me, well, 2050, it's a long time away. But bear in mind, we're talking about having say 10,000 fully, maybe not fully, maybe, maybe level eight autonomous robots um, working by themselves in the city. Um, so it's quite a difficult challenge to do that. But that's what we're aiming for. That's our, that's our ultimate target, what we're trying to do. Um, and just an example here of what can happen if you don't do that. So this was a, um, a pipe in Manchester, a place called Mancunian Way in Manchester. Um, the pipe, what happened is the pipe got a micro crack. So a really small crack appeared in that pipe. That water trickled out. It washed away some water below the pipe. The pipe then bent. It cracked. More water came out. And this is all, of course, below the road surface. No one knows it's there. And at some point, though, when the actual material has gone away so, so much, you have this massive um, crater opening up. So a simple example of how 